Theater. And the, uh, you see the title is Web 2.0 Media Strategies to Reach Vertical Markets. And if you read the abstract, we're going to be looking at how we're reaching our modern customer 2.0. Focus on integrated uh, web and non-web media. And um, you know, what, what are the factors there? One of the uh, examples we'll be looking at is some webinar promotion. Uh, but the big focus of this discussion is going to be integrated strategies. Uh, let me uh, give you a little background. Uh, my name is Jeff Cauley. I'm with Northwest Analytics. We're a firm that does uh, software for manufacturing. Original core competency was lab information management. Uh, people were asking for the statistics module from that, so we put out one of the very early statistics packages for PCs. That morphed into the demand for meeting uh, statistical process control for the manufacturing line. Got more and more out of the lab and into the process. And these days we're doing larger scale quality information systems, analytics for the enterprise, et cetera. So in all this time, <coughs> and in my previous incarnation where I worked for an analytical instrumentation firm, the director the head of marketing there, in addition to the industrial uh, side of the operation. It's always been this problem of how do we face some real vertical market people. And one of the things that, uh, again, we'll discuss is that is part of the nature of customer 2.0, the one that you've seen in the title of all of these discussions, is that we are looking at extreme segmentation the, uh, as I said, integrated strategies I've always found to be very important to talk to these. And indeed, we're going to have more begatting this morning than your typical Genesis chapter, uh, because that is one of the secrets of this, that a webinar begats a white paper, begats a TV program, begats whatever, all down the line. One continuous lineage, in fact, all have as a, a prequel to the webinar thing that we'll be discussing later is an earlier uh, progression that we did for uh, some food safety work that actually ultimately led to one of the webinars, but over a matter of years, just building on one another event. Um, both of these strategies that we'll be discussing deal with uh, what I have facetiously coined as uh, Cauley's first law and Cauley's second law. Cauley's first law is what's easy gets done. I've never had anybody dispute that one. Uh, and then Cauley's second law is write once, publish many. And that is the core of my marketing philosophy that we will be discussing. So let us start looking at this Describe who the, uh, the characteristics of the customer 2.0, and then tell the stories of these uh, different promotional sagas. What are the characteristics of customer 2.0? Well, as a lot of discussions have mentioned here, they're pretty much overextended people. <clears throat> We're having to really work hard to get their attention. Uh, we've had downsizing, right sizing, etc. in various industries, hollowing out of engineering staffs, management staffs, etc. More people are having to do much more with less, all that type of thing. So again, we're really competing for their attention. Corollary for that, they're time limited. Um, the probability that they're going to be willing to spend a few hours looking at our well-crafted content is pretty low. They're going to need it in units that they can handle in their schedule. Um, they are certainly embedded in vertical markets. 
Uh, let me get a feeling here for people in the audience. How many people here are servicing uh, well-defined verticals or are general market firms? Uh, who, who's in, you know, a small... So the rest of you are just blanketing all the automation markets? All right. Uh, you had sort of a... Well, yeah, we're not a small world, but we're in large verticals. I mean, I mean, I mean, to answer your question more accurately. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, we're oil and gas and mining and, you know, okay. not really small. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I should say, you know, uh, small in the sense of, uh, you know, as far as the total manufacturing market, you know, just, you know, one sector of it as opposed to being generic, I'm into manufacturing. But yeah, uh, and that certainly is characteristic of a lot of folk that you, for obvious reasons, uh, to trade on your expertise and everything, try to focus on that area. So anyway, a lot of these customers are embedded in vertical markets. Another side effect is that, of course, they can simultaneously occupy several vertical market descriptions. You know, maybe it's their an oil person. Uh, maybe for part of their existence, uh, they are looking at specifying instrumentation, another part of software, so they get into the IT type of sector. Perhaps they have some management responsibility. But all of these things are little verticals that we are having to reach them through and to communicate in the idiom of each of those. Along with that, of course, is that most people that we're talking to are clearly computer and web savvy. So we're not having to educate on uh, fundamentals of uh, how to do a video or something else, but rather we can depend upon them to use those kind of vehicles. However, it also means they are wide ranging and again, we're having to compete for their attention. And that leads to the uh, final point in this description is that the customer 2.0 themselves are driving the information gathering process. And this is very important as has been mentioned in many sessions that I've sat in here, <coughs> that by the time the customer and we start our discussion, they have a great deal of background information. Not only for what is generally available, but what's the specific characteristics of, our, of both our products and our competitors' products. In many respects, it's wonderful. We don't have to spend as much effort for uh, base level uh, education of the customer but we certainly do have to be able to cut through both perception and misperceptions that they've gotten courtesy of our competitors and perhaps other people who have other things. So what are we going to use to talk to these folks? Well, we've heard a lot of the new media versus the old media. Basically, as I say, we just want to effectively communicate to our targeted public. And so we're going to use a mix of these things. With a heavy emphasis, just because of the overhead and time requirements on a lot of the new media. But it is much less the generation of the media than the effectiveness and the overhead. So I tend to try to suppress the hype about it. Um, this may be the latest discussion on the magazine rack or on the web. Uh, you know, if one is addicted to CNET, you can get the, uh, the new, their newsletters, the most breathless hype about the latest permutation of some particular form of uh, social <coughs> networking or the latest gadget. I mean, uh, good heavens, I would be replacing a cell phone every 17 point three seconds if I really believed all the reviews and the videos. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's so easy to call it up in. But we must, uh, to be able to satisfy our needs, uh, be able to cut through that and figure out 
what is it that's going to accomplish our task. So what kind of the web-based media are useful? Well, top two that I look at, you know, LinkedIn and YouTube, we're going to be looking at those a bit, uh, important. GoToWebinar is the particular um, web uh, conferencing platform that I use. There are many others. Uh, we've heard Twitter discussion helps support it. Wikipedia, one I like, and it's uh, often overlooked by people, but remember, we all can contribute to this, and it gives a certain sense of authority to we'll look at it you there. Blogs, of course, one of the classics, and you know, certainly should be a primary thought in our mind. And of course, email, which these days sort of balances on the boundary between new and old media, the way things have evolved. But these kind of categories are important. However, some old media just had to die. I've got a question. You have to be under 35. People can answer. All of you under 35, do you know what these green books are? <laughs> My goodness, how the ephemera of our industrial world have vanished from our look. Bingo. <laughs> Is that fun? <laughs> no, sort of. It's a registered. That is a phone book. Phone book is about equally obsolescent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But those are yellow. It actually works from. No, that's true. That's true. Now, you obviously know. Yes. If you would care to inform the audience what these oh, green books are. Thomas Register. Thomas Register. <laughs> Used to be the way of finding companies when you wanted to know. You were looking for a widget. You went to the Thomas Register and looked it up. I do firmly believe. These two volumes of the Thomas Register are the last extant volumes in downtown Portland. <laughs> the only reason they still exist is that one of our salespeople, Len Tice, put these under a, uh, a big clunky old Dell uh, computer monitor about 15 plus years ago to boost its height. And ever since, they've just lived as a support for the different generations of her monitors. The rest of them long ago went to be pulped and recycled. But this is clearly an obsolescent form that we're not going to worry about integrating with. Why? Well, the online uh, capabilities for finding product, finding vendors, so much better, and so much more informative. You look at something like a Thomas Register, which was state of the art a couple decades ago, uh, the actual amount of information you can put in there, A, is fairly small, and you had capabilities to bump up your listing and everything, but uh, it was fairly small compared to the reams that could go online today. And secondly, it became obsolescent very rapidly as product lines changed, evolved, new versions, etc. So, some old media had to die. And remember, you've seen the last two copies of Thomas Register for volumes in downtown Portland. So what kind of characteristics are we going to look at as we choose the media we're going to use to do our outreach? Well, we're looking at planning our message. How can we incorporate it to time everything else? We uh, want to create high value content. Content marketing, as we've been hearing a lot in this session, is critically important. Again, that customer 2.0 is looking for a lot of high quality information put together in an easily digested package that is available to them when they want it. Another benefit of creating this high value content is that we establish credibility. We must always keep in mind that part of the mission for the promotional activity we're doing 
is to get into that vendor shortlist and the next step. And if we uh, do not make that grade, part of the reason is we just didn't look as believable or as sharp. So how can we keep our credibility up? Again, very targeted type of information. We are doing narrow casting these days. The broadcasting model for promotion and outreach just isn't going to do it for us. A, it's terribly inefficient. We're just looking at engineers and managers in petroleum plants, say just refineries for a particular product. Well, we want to zero in. What are the people who are doing the operations and engineering in the refineries? How are they getting their information? We have to really narrow cast down to that. We can use some general media, throw an ad out there, but how many of the readers of that are going to really care about a product that is specifically focused on operational management in a refinery? So, unless we like to waste a lot of money, I don't. Uh, we, uh, you know, need to go into that mindset. Another point is consistency. <clears throat> By here, I mean consistency of message. You build it up, it repeats, it builds upon each subsequent generation of the uh, message that's been put out there, and people will come to again, you know, looking at establishing credibility having good visibility, you're repeating it and repeating it. One of the joys of doing modern electronic digital based promotion is it's so easy to cross-link, hyperlink, whatever term you like, of linking all of the, sub the different promotions together and having each one lead to the next. Keep the story going, keep it going hard. And then finally, Whatever we're going to be doing with this media, we need to speak to that customer and involve them in the conversation. Those factors, of course, as we get into it, are one of the things I love about webinars. Jeff? Yeah. If I could just add some emphasis to the cross-linking, I mm -hmm. think from search engine optimization standpoint, that is one of the most ignored opportunities <clears throat> that companies have to really easily add search engine opti or improve the search engine optimization because that's that's a big <coughs> tell, a big factor that the um, that the engines use when they're crawling the website is the anchor text on links pointing to your own content. So that's a way to help the search engines help you is by making use of that technique. Yeah. Very, very true. Very true. <coughs> So let's tell the first little story. Right on published many, call a second law. This particular story starts back at a turkey plant in Georgia, back about 1996. And here we see a turkey assuming the position, about to be examined for microbial level in this flesh. And this was part of a study that I had a client who was a technical director of ConAgra's Prepared Foods Division. Um, we go to what, 10 or 10.30? <clears throat> I don't know. I think it's 10.30. 10 10.30. Okay, good. Um, and the, uh, the game here was how do you keep the food safe, especially food like this that doesn't have a kill step before it leaves the plant. In other words, there's nothing happening in that processing line that's going to kill whatever salmonella and other goodies are on that carcass. So there is a thing in food processing. How many people here get involved in food processing at all? John? Anybody else? Uh, 
there is a, um, a systematic approach to food safety. It's called HACCP. You may have seen the term in the news. Hazard Analysis <coughs> Critical Control Point is what it stands for. And basically, it's a specialized form of risk assessment, risk management uh, that happens in food processing. And it has evolved since the early days when Pillsbury set up the first versions of this for NASA, the space program, because he wanted to make sure the food going up in the capsule was safe. Nothing worse than food poisoning a zero G going 17,000 miles an hour. Just not pleasant. And especially in the early days when you're wearing a diaper. So, that has evolved over time and become the global standard for how we set up uh, food safety. Most people, however, treat this as a inspection only type of circumstance. We're looking at, like let's say in this case, our tests need to come back and we can have no more than a thousand colony forming units of say generic E. coli in a, sw a swap of uh, this turkey. And uh, that's all to look at. Are we at a thousand or are we less? Absolutely no understanding of the underlying process. A few colleague colleagues and I, since we're involved with SPC and analytics, uh, said, well, you know, I think there's something important here to do process management. You know, the, we look at a stable process as possible and as narrow a variation as possible. We can give a better chance for success. So we did this study along uh, with our customer, ConAgra, and a colleague of mine who was at Clemson at that time. And that became a paper published in 1998 uh, in uh, a food trade press on integrating SBC and HACCP. So that's a long time ago. You know, in a paper magazine, remember those? And uh, <clears throat> so that is one particular thread of our promotional activities, which we have milked for the last 13 years because it's good fundamental material. And we're still linked to the postings on that. So what came out of this? Again, we're going to get Old Testament Genesis here. So the integrating uh, HACCP and SPC begat a webcast. This particular one, uh, let's see, this one was about yeah, 2005. Um, we had gotten involved with one of our clients with the Agricultural Marketing Service of the USDA and this was uh, done by the, the person who was writing the specifications for ground beef purchased by the school lunch program. And he had, uh, with uh, John Sarax, a colleague of mine I mentioned, uh, training and encouragement, had studied how other people in other industries were doing their supply chain vendor certification and quality management. And SPC was an important component of that. So he actually wrote the specs for this. And they were very successful. In the, from 2003 to current, when these are running, they have yet to deliver any ground beef to a school that tests positive for E. coli or salmonella. Very good record, much better than commercial. So we recruited uh, Steve Olson, the guy's name did a webinar. Well, that webinar begat a little symposium at the Food Safety and Security Summit, which I helped organize, get up there in the platform, etc. And that begat a feature article in Food Quality. The pattern here, one thing leads to another. Take advantage, you know, uh, don't be shy about talking to people about what you're doing. That led, uh, actually one of the things I found to be very useful, this is uh, Silicer, uh online newsletter. 
or ESCO. Silicer is one of the world's big uh, food safety consulting firms. They've, over the last decade, been buying up laboratories all around the world, and they were providing a contract uh, <clears throat> bacteriological analyses for the uh, AMS in the school lunch program. So, here is a natural partner. Again, look at opportunity. Here you have something that has a monthly reach of about 90,000 subscribers. Beats a lot of publications. And uh, that kind of partnering is an important part of how you do this integrated web-based promotion. Look for those opportunities. So that uh, enabled us to write again about this whole trend in our storyline of using SPC and analytics for food safety. And of course, you can't leave this standing by itself, as John was saying, that cross-linking is important. And here's a little blog that John and I have run over, that John Surak and I have run over many years. And, you know, referencing back to that in the previous ones. Oh, and while we're at it, here is a screencast of the original presentation that triggered this. That, of course, led to a nice feature uh, cover story of this. And you just keep pumping it. And of course, all of these things we have cross-linked on the web uh, addresses for the uh, online copies of this stuff and all the material. Then we lucked into, well, again, fortune favors to prepare, uh, a firm that is a small-scale specialized TV producer. As I'm sure many of you observe by now, unless you are living in some rural area where you just have you know, a still pair of uh, a Yagi antenna on your roof, there is a huge mall out there consuming every type of media preparation you can for the three billion and one television channels that we have between cable and direct online, etc. <clears throat> now, the fact that much of that is repetitious and derivative, that's a different issue for a different seminar. However, there are a number of these specialty producers. And a very inexpensive figure, actually less than I could have run a phone crew, uh, we got a partial sponsorship for a program, a series that they were doing on food safety. And we featured uh, the school lunch program application of SPC in their purchasing and uh, took to one of our customers, which is this particular case, a firm called Cherry Meats, in the south side of Chicago, yeah. down in the old stockyards area, one of the few last meat processing plants down there. It's cool. So, all of a sudden, we have a real TV show, real video, high production. Mix in with our own uh, homebrew stuff. That led to the creation of a DVD, which was been a very good giveaway. <clears throat> and of course, the DVD has a bunch of uh, slide casts on it and PDFs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, integrate. And then John and I also did uh, some Wikipedia uh, entries on the food safety and HACCP area cross-referencing all this stuff, of course. And of course, being a very subtle type person, I have to go mainline on YouTube. And uh, split the uh, program into small segments. Uh, people can download easily. God has even sung with this handsome, authoritative individual play the talking head. Um, my few 15 seconds of fame. I do not aspire for the minutes yet. And of course, obviously, a little tie-in with the blog entry again, linking to those. And the our release of that film 
we did at a uh, food safety show. The editor of food engineering happened to be one of the ones who responded to the tickets I was sending out. And that, of course, led to another feature article. So keep it just tied. This is, again, this is more begetting than uh, whatever uh, Israeli uh, uh, ancestors of the first part of Genesis there. And this is uh, Perry Poles of the Cherry Meat Packers, and part of the text in that article. So, as you can see, that type of consistency, cross linking, and generating keeps a long string going. And it just gives you an enormous amount of material and makes you look very authoritative to vendors. Yeah. So, I think it sounds like a really good way to you know, use your resources efficiently and effectively and, and get a lot of airtime, I guess, mm -hmm. from that by reaching a lot of people. But if we're trying to create high value, credible content, this seems to be like, you know, verses 1 through 27 of the same song. Mm -hmm. So, I guess to create that high value of content, you know, how else do you change the message? How else do you keep it interesting so that the guy who sees you cross link, what is this? Oh, it's the same thing I read. It's a video? Well, it's the same thing they told me. Well, you know, and didn't get tired of it. You oh, see what I'm saying? Sure. And if you just kept the content absolutely static, that'd be true. So you're continually pushing it forward? And yes. Okay. Well, well, the story has evolved over the years in that particular. And I see this is one particular strain. You know, we try to develop for different markets, different <coughs> strains that we can take. Very strange. I was going to say, I think one of the other points is that part of the strategy of reuse is that it's, it's actually fairly <coughs> rare for that to happen. So in other words, somebody is going to run across just the YouTube video or just the webinar or just the article in one of the magazines. So it's, it, it, it's taking the you know the the work that you put in once and just wringing every last bit of a drop of, of value that you can get out of it by syndicating it it's almost like uh, you know this is the same model that they do with uh, you know sitcoms and reruns you know they, they, they run it once during the, the season and if it's successful enough then they just syndicate it out on as many channels as possible and just in, in the, right and you just keep you know, it's 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 going to diminish, obviously, right? If you look, I just saw an interesting. Um, sorry, I hope I have an it, but uh, there was an interesting blog article a couple of days that I that I tweeted out. It's it's from um, the URL shortening service Bitly, and they've analyzed millions and millions of links that they've shortened, and they published a study of the half life of these things, uh, which is about three hours, <coughs> except for YouTube, where it's seven. So, it's, which was kind of interesting, they, they looked across the gamut. So when you look at Facebook, Twitter, um, direct email, um, direct messaging, pretty much everywhere across the board, the half-life of a digital message is about three hours, uh, unless it's on YouTube where it's seven. So it's, um, it comes up a lot when you look at uh, strategies for sending updates out on Twitter, right? There's, kind of, there's a little bit of controversy there about whether or not you repeat yourself. There are some uh, people on Twitter who have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers. Part of their strategy is, I'm thinking particularly about like Guy Kawasaki, right? That's, he's been unapologetic about this from the beginning. He tells everybody, yeah, I pre-schedule my tweets and I'll send the same tweet out eight times a day every three hours. And he does it because it works, number one. Number two, he had data long before Bitly showed this data. He had data that was showing that, you know, your audience is very hit or miss. I guess that's where I'm trying to get at. So when you're, when you're publishing all this content, um, you, you want to put it in as many places as possible. Because especially today, you go back 15 years ago, and, you know, people were going to find you in the Thomas Register or the one or two trade magazines for oil and gas or water, wastewater or whatever they read, and that was it. Today, they've got 150 different channels where they might be able to come across your message, so it's just harder to, mm -hmm. to you know, find people where they are at the time they're there. Right. And it's also the, 
harsh reality that one particular form of the presentation <coughs> in one particular episode, you reach a limited number of people. I mean, here, standing before you and making this presentation, I'm talking to, what, roughly 20 folks. And you all, of course, are just going to remember this as one of the highlights of your experience. True, but you still are 20 people. Now, this uh, you know, goes on video, uh, YouTube, goes on the ISA site, the slide share, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that propagates out. You know, it's the type of thing that <clears throat> any talk, like uh, giving one at a, uh, a, a trade show, a professional meeting, typically you're, you're lucky if you get maybe 100 people to sit in the audience and listen to you. And uh, so the, the whole thing is to increase the reach. Remember the classic bits of advertising, what? Reach and frequency. So that's what we're looking at here. Plus, you know, as John was saying, you, know, you have different people coming in at different times, et cetera. No, that's good. Okay. Sorry, sorry, guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, next, we're going to look at a particular recent case study that actually has its roots in that little bit of history that I was giving you to show a consistency over a few years to the given market. And this will be a webinar series that we did this last season, basically fall and spring. And what are the components of making a webinar series successful? Well, you want to spend a fair amount of time doing the defining and planning for the event. These things are not accidental. Now true, the overhead for a webinar is typically less than, say, that TV program that we got involved with. But it's still significant. And you are going to be putting your time, your effort, and you also have the opportunity cost of what else could you have been doing at that time. So you want to plan well enough ahead that you're going to maximize the return. Then we're going to be looking at what can we do to promote this? Again, right, once published many aspect of it, we're going to do a lot of cross-linking, things feeding into one another, and increase our outreach to the press audience. Of course, the execution, try and do that successfully. <clears throat> Follow up to the attendees and registrants, and then the repurposing, which we've been talking about a lot here. Write once, publish many. Keep that outreach going. I mean, you've already done the hard work in organizing the material, getting all the resources you need, you know, in the way of images, charts, diagrams, etc., text. It shouldn't live, live just in one little space on a website or in the back of a brochure. It just wants to live a lot. So let it live a lot in many, many spaces on the web. Okay, why use a webinar as a vehicle? Well, let's look at two competing forms of doing the same kinds of things and where are the virtues. This again is a flash from the past, taken in the early 90s down in Silicon Gulch, Santa Clara. A uh, man was one of our customers and, uh, at the IBM disk drive plant in San Jose and offered him and some of his colleagues a golden parachute. They were restructuring and uh, Lou Taft, uh, the other guys, decided to go into consulting. They still were relatively young. And they got involved with us. So here we have, we have rented uh, space, any space within a uh, hotel. Actually, that was a little center they had down in San Jose, a little bit, business center. So we were running that, of course, paying the catering, everything else. Sent out direct mail, a little bit of telephone work, call the local people, uh, cover loose expenses, everything else. 
and for half a day we get to talk, oh in this case, to around two dozen people. You know, that was what you did back then as a mainstay. We still occasionally will do the roadshow type of thing, but there's a huge amount of overhead here. You've got all the facility costs, of course, all the upfront time and cost of finding the facility, renting it, you know, the staff involved with that process. Uh, you have the time of your staff away from the office. In this particular case, three of our staff, including myself, were down there participating in the uh, roadshow. And that included, uh, you know, mostly account execs looking for prospects. So you're looking at a lot of time and effort. And you have to do it very, very well to make it pay. The second competitor to this is speaking at a conference. And uh, this particular one that I was speaking at, uh, this be a little bit exotic, it was in Beijing, you know, it was fun. But that, you could see me with that posture in all sorts of conferences all around the world, et cetera, basically the same message. <clears throat> and these are useful in several levels. But again, your functional limit, I think the Beijing was probably the biggest audience I ever had for this kind of presentation. It was maybe about 250 people. But typically, it's less than 100. Now, both the roadshow and the platform presentations of various meetings have a virtue of very high touch. We get to meet people, have coffee together, you know, perhaps a drink in the bar afterwards, really work stuff out, perhaps run into each other <clears throat> for a period of a couple few days. You know, very high value stuff, but still very high cost also. So, let us look at setting up a webinar as an alternative to that. Well, as I mentioned, we want to define and plan this very well. Now, who is the target audience? What kind of messaging are we going to have? What results are we targeting? And what kind of metrics are we going to use to make to see that we are achieving our aims? And we can also track this to see if we have continuous improvement in our efforts. So the first part, who is the target audience? This particular sequence of webinars that we'll be discussing focused around the idea of standards compliant safety management systems. There is a thing in the uh, food industry called the Global Food Safety Initiative. And this is something that began about a decade ago in Europe where the big grocery chains were wanting to protect themselves because they were contracting for manufacturing. Nothing more embarrassing to have people dropping dead in Brussels or wherever because they've been eating some nasty beans that had your label on it. You know, if you're Carrefour's or Metro or Tesco or one of the other big European chains, this is very, very bad business. So they started uh, as a collaborative effort to define what kind of audit procedures would be accepted. Uh, in almost every industry, and food is no exception, you've got many people competing for, we're going to provide the audit standards for you. So they set up the group standards that they would find acceptable, and the idea being that if the food producer chose any one of these audits, they would be just deemed equivalent to the others. Because what had been happened, each one of these chains had been doing their own audit. So a given manufacturer, during the course of a year, may be hosting literally 
dozens of audits. And has anyone here ever been involved with an audit by a vendor? Oh, it's a glorious experience. <laughs> it typically involves a lot of prep. You gotta look your Sunday vest. And you know, that new coat of paint, and, you know, finally get to scrub things out, da da da. Of course, a good auditor sees right through that. The paint's still wet, you know? But, um, but this is important because these type of commercial standards have one of the biggest hammers upon a uh, vendor compliance. Do you want to do business? Do you want to get paid? This comes pretty much at the core of why we're doing things. So that, and then the companion standard called ISO 22000, uh, which I was fortunate we had a little inside there because uh, that colleague of mine I mentioned earlier is John Serac, uh, was the head of the US delegation to this that was writing the standards, so we did a lot of talking and writing together. Uh, and this was all very timely. It was on everybody's uh, uh, lips because it's been gaining a huge amount of uh, momentum here in the United States also. Uh, especially when Walmart, you've heard of them, I think, uh, bought into it and told all of their customers that by this year they had to be compliant. Or vendors, excuse me. Now, of course, if you are selling to Walmart's food centers and the thing, the message comes down, Thou shalt be compliant with the Global Food Safety Initiative. This tends to get your attention. And then other players, like for example Kroger, which is the largest pure play grocer in North America, and the eighth largest generally in North America, went the same way, and uh, you said piling on, piling on. Till now, <clears throat> roughly half of all the grocery purchases in the world are covered by supply chain audits under the Global Food Safety Initiative. A lot of momentum built up. So we figured that would be a hot topic, plus it fit directly in with the whole story that we were telling that particular industry. Now, another big industry for us is packaging. And one thing that happened starting the spring of last year, many organizations had gotten through the high-risk people, like say the ground beef producers and the poultry producers, going through the different types of processed foods, and they were now getting down to things like packaging. And remember that besides the grocery chains, the restaurant chains are starting to hop onto this as a good idea. They have the same kind of problem. Did you say Jack in the Box? You know, things like that. Um, so, in fact, McDonald's has one of their people, Cindy Jang, uh, who sits on the technical board of directors for the Global Food Safety Initiative. They're somewhat involved. So, starting the spring of last year, all these packaging guys get the message, you had better be able to do a compliant, demonstrate a compliant safety management system in your operation. Again, if you want to do business, and if you want to get paid, big motivation. So, along with the people producing beef patties, the people producing containers were of interest. So we said, now this is very interesting. Get some high attention, get some uh, uh, high profile, timely. So we did a series of four that focused primarily on food, and then a series of three uh, that focused on the packaging side of that follow. So that basically covered the two seasons there, of, well, actually late fall into winter and spring for a whole series of webinars. And of course, they fed pretty much into one another. Again, a lot of nice crossing. So that's where you're defining our target here. Food producers, packaging producers, and especially those who are selling to larger food processors, uh, food service companies, uh, and the grocery chains. Messaging. Now fortunately we had some insight 
into what were critical elements of the message for this group of people. Uh, and also, obviously, look at what the discussions are in your trade press and your discussion boards and so forth in your particular industry. Pick up the scent of what is hot and what is happening now. Also, another thing, again, the kind of tools that we have available for little or no cost and are web based is send out a survey. You have in your customer base people who are highly representative of the people you want to add to your customer base. Ask them, you know, what is it that's bothering you? What's keeping you up at night? What can we do to help you? So out of this, craft your message. I need to define what kind of results we're going to look for and the metrics. And we'll look at this in a minute here. So in the definition of planning, we now get to the grunt type of stuff. What are the mechanics that we're going to need to have in place? The creative, who's going to be doing that, et cetera. Uh, how are we going to deliver this? Who's responsible for each aspect of it? And what kind of deadlines? Just a practical note, uh, we use a nested spreadsheet type of thing. Anything that you want to use for your checklist is important. The big component in all of this is that you have high visibility as to every aspect of the project. And you have, especially with a electronic-based uh, system like this, the ability to set up an alarm. You're getting late on this particular aspect. Um, you need to drop that next email tomorrow. So it's just important, good practice, and uh, this, like any other project, choose whatever type of mechanism that uh, you find useful. So again, back to that. Uh, Can I ask a question here? Sure. Can we We've been through this process many times. We do a lot of webinars, and one of the um, challenges that we find is getting lists of email names to email our invitations to. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions there? Or is it you know? Do you buy a list? Do you go to a pub and pay to have it sent out? Is it through associations? Is it all of the above? It can be all of the above, and depends what works for you. I tend to not like buying email lists. I've had some pretty mixed experience there. And uh, I don't have much confidence in the quality of those. Now, one of the things that we do a lot of is uh, we have some telemarketing follow-up to when people check off something, so we're constantly gathering names uh, from uh, web registrations for various bits of collateral on the website. Uh, we certainly look at professional organization lists for targeting a company, for example. You know, who from Kroger or who from Crown Court and Seal or whatever uh, can we identify that have the right kind of titles, right kind of uh, so you're building it in a lot of different ways. The important thing is that you have the list as high a quality as possible. Because uh, can spam regs are real. Uh, and certainly your ISP and or your mail service do not look fondly upon uh, bad results uh, from that mailing list. So I would much rather have a smaller list high quality as I can make it than a large list. You know, you get a pinpoint or somebody else saying, here are 27,000 uh, management uh, within, say, the packaging industry. Eh, oh. And you start looking at it, you know, what's the actual deliverability rate, you know, how many of these people really are opted in, etc. It gets to be an issue. You're depending upon that not ruin your good name and your ISP or your email service may also get very stressed because they can't afford to have their good name smirched 
five people uh, writing spam complaints. So again, I would rather do the small but you know, very well developed list approach. Another way to think about it is completely reverse your question. Instead of saying, you know, how do we get lists to tell people about our webinars, use your webinars to build a high quality list. Yeah, but if people don't know about it, it's it's a process. You know, use use all the tools, all the web two point tools out there, you know, and encourage people to share the links. Um, I mean that that's one of the processes. If you look at new uh, businesses that are launching, that's a key aspect of a launch strategy for any business right now uh, or product is to you know, build a complete pre-launch strategy and the webinars are an absolute key part of that. So what they'll do is they'll build out a strategy. Okay, here's our launch. We're going to do a series of three webinars. And we're going to send out invites and every one of those webinars um, when people sign up for them, you're going to add them to your targeted uh, email base, so, uh, email list. So every webinar you do, it's going to increase, and then the people that do attend, you can follow up with them, ask them to forward the links on, and it just kind of snowballs and builds on itself. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah, this is really an organic process. You're you're tending your garden as opposed to. Yeah. I was also just going to suggest to it. it I, and I'm new to this industry, so this may not work here, but from my, my previous job, what we did, we would find like professional organizations and find these people and find these organizations. And then we hired interns that got pretty nitty gritty, but basically to do the research and find the people to focus on. And it, it took time and it took, you know, I mean, for them it wasn't the most, you know, exciting job, but we found they really high quality list. I mean, because you're going out to these websites and so just, you know, looking for this title, this person. So, I mean, I'm not sure if that would work in this industry, but, I mean, that's a thought, too. It, well, it that's, another, <laughs> that's another thing people are starting to experiment with, is instead of you, interns using things like Mechanical Turk, um, and there are all kinds of um, virtual assistant and, uh, you know, yeah. services that are springing up. Most of them are, are, you know, they're coming from emerging economies where people, you know, they can afford to work well, not afford, but you know, working a, a full day for fifty dollars, you know, puts food on their table for a month, and they can do those sorts of very mechanical research okay. things that are, you know, can be pretty cost effective. Thank you. That's good mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, as we go forward here, we'll look at some of that type of cross-linking where you can harvest more stuff. Okay. And, and, and that that hopefully. Not subtle from what I'm saying is that that, that type of cross linking and building is you know, is an underlying strategy here, and it, it, it's not the instantaneous having the twenty thousand names that you can do, but you're building on quality. And again, for a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with, uh, how many people here are with significant capital expenditure type pro uh, products and services, you know, bigger ticket stuff? The kind of people who are buying your stuff are not the guy who used to sit in the back room in Tom's Register but now does web type stuff. It's a purchasing agent. We're talking about people who have some management status within an organization. So we want to look very narrowly at them. And it's wasted effort to talk to the purchasing guy or to a plant floor technician, etc. I mean, if they hear the conversation, in the process, that's okay. Our game here is to get to that committee that's going to define and uh, you know create the short list for the project. Now, that is what our goal is with this effort, and this is a you know fairly specified, specific group of people. So that's who we need to identify. My experience with a lot of list brokers is. Uh, uh, they don't do such a really good job of, uh, <laughs> of delivering you those kind of people. So, metrics are we going to define ourselves for this? Well, this particular one is the, uh, the first one in the packaging series, Food Safety Audits for Food Container Manufacturers. Mm. However, it was really hot because the uh, as I said, the container people, starting 
the spring before were getting the word that they had better get something in place like now if they want to continue doing business with small corporations such as McDonald's and Wendy's and so forth. So we had an email list. This was a mix of uh, customer base, prospects, uh, leads that were being developed, various points of our lead development process, and uh, other sources that we had gotten from our site, et cetera. And that was about 4,300 people. Um, and I defined, identified the 27 places I was going to send an online release. Uh, I had eight LinkedIn groups that identified the postings. This, by the way, is, spoiler alert, one of my favorite high productive ways to promote this type of stuff. And our registration target was 100 people, and we figured the attendance would be 50. Yeah, again, just some metrics we can work with you know, of what we see as common practice. By the way, that 50% attendance rate holds remarkably constant. Uh, over the webinars we've been doing for a few years, it's like 50% plus or minus 10. I mean, the envelope is from around 40 on one end up around 60 on the other. Almost never see it go above 60, and almost never see it go below 40 for tennis set attendance. So it, it just, it's an incredibly stable process. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know, has anybody uh, observed that with your, your work? 50% almost without, without fail. Yeah, it's truly remarkable just how it, it does come out. So that, the reason for setting those metrics is, you know, how are we doing? You know, we're not going to be a slave to these, but we need some reference point as we go forward. And of course, as you may guess, from our business, and I tend to be somewhat oriented to collecting data, analyzing it, etc. Put bread and butter on the table for a while, so it happens. Okay, so this was another webinar in the series, uh, the impact of new regulations and standards on packaging traceability. And again, I'm sure you're all queuing up, but a lot of people did. Um, in this particular case, Total registration was 146 people. We had uh, pretty good conversion happening on our landing page. Nice. We had 183 unique visitors in the sign-up period to this. Registration conversion of 80%. One bit of data here. The visitors to this landing page that uh, were 24 from social media, which in this particular case, 13% of our people coming to the registration page were coming out of social media. The big one always with these is email to a highly qualified list. But that was a pleasant surprise to me and it confirmed some of the things I thought would be happening until we started you know, re examining what was happening in this series. That 13% of the registrations were coming primarily out of LinkedIn. And considering, as we look at it here, the amount of time, effort, and cost involved in doing that, very productive. And uh, again, no surprise, the registration you know, closely follows email blasts with their trigger. And those email blasts, as we see, may not necessarily be all ours, but actually coming from the LinkedIn groups. Uh, this is the secondary blips that occur with the, uh, the weekly uh, LinkedIn summaries. How many people are aware of those LinkedIn summary alerts? Okay, so you've gotten those from the groups that you're in. So we're gonna see, it's a wonderful promotional aspect. And you know what the cost is to you? That's right, everybody sees a three ring sign, all the old Valentine drinkers here. Okay. So again, promote. We're identifying the most effective methods, email, social media, some advertising. We actually found uh, for some of these that the text advertising <coughs> in other people's letters, like let's say food quality newsletter, or uh, people like say Silicon, we did a development agreement with, to do the text block type advertising, 
that worked pretty well for this. I, I personally would not recommend using standard display advertising. Too much lead time, too much cost, and it really isn't for something immediate like the webinar promotion. So, here is our email uh, invitation that goes out. Title, date, time, short description, discussion with the speaker. Try to recruit as uh, authoritative and exciting speakers you can get. Tatiana, Larka, colleague of mine, Institute of Food Technologies, uh, also very good. She is another person who sits on the technical board of the Global Food Safety Initiative and heads up the audit training division for EcoLab. So get somebody like that who speaks with authority. And one of the things to be looking at for your alliances and your linkages here is that this is part of her promotional efforts too. So you're looking for people to partner with who both have the same objective and you can go forward together. LinkedIn groups, my particular pet favorite. This particular one is actually one group that I set up. It's for the Institute of Food Technologists Quality Assurance Division, which I've been active in over the years. Uh, posting your webinars and discussion item. Now, as you go into the different specialty groups, depending on the kind of promotion you're doing, just uh, take a look at how they're set up. Some groups are not at all sympathetic with people posting uh, your discussions like this. So, you know, scope it out first. Is there going to be a problem? If not, move on to someone else. Also, here, I, I'm totally comfortable posting a general informative webinar like this as a discussion item because it's valid and people respond to it pretty well. The, uh, I would not post a really aggressive product brochure type of piece here. That, that just is not going to work very well with uh, LinkedIn groups. So we have the webinar description. You'll notice here we're doing LinkedIn. You can uh, you attach a link section at the bottom window. That pops up the uh, actual registration link picture of the speaker that happens to be on that page, yes? How early do you typically start promoting these webinars? I know you don't want to do it the day before, but you know, too far out. Uh, two to three weeks. Okay. Uh, trying to get any earlier than that is, is a waste of effort. Mm -hmm. uh, other than the sense of saying listing, you know, this is the, the webinars we're going to be doing this time period. But as far as the actual direct promotion, uh, you know, two weeks out is sort of uh, the magic. You have some preliminary stuff you're going to be doing, like sending uh, notices to various blogs, newsletters, online sites. Try to do that a little bit earlier. But uh, you want to just really start the effort approximately two weeks out. And that seems to be my sweet spot. I, anybody have any other feelings about that as to uh, kind of lead time? Um, I've, I've read a couple of reports on doing product launches, uh, specifically using webinars, and um, what is coming out pretty consistently is there are a couple of magic windows, and um, it's uh, one week and 24 hours and one hour. Those are the three, that's what they consider to be the three magic windows, and they um, they follow that that schedule along, where they'll you know they'll send out the original, or the you know the first email blast a week out, and then the the 24 hour reminder is, is absolutely uh, critical to uh, you know remind people that uh, that they signed up for it, and then the one hour again is critical because again people just get busy and, and forget. Right. But 6 a.m. the day of. Mm -hmm. So it's the first thing in their <laughs> so list. You recommend advertising an upcoming webinar on LinkedIn. John, what do you feel about advertising on Twitter? 
because I kind of understood oh, yeah. not don't put a press release on Twitter, but this is an event, so that would be sure, a better sure. hook to go on Twitter. So kind of okay with that, right? You bet. Yeah, Absolutely. And from a frequency perspective, I would say on Twitter you want to do it a couple of times a day, every day. Really? So, yeah, okay. that's what that's what I um, that's what we did for the marketing and sales. Zone. You know, okay. we were sending out um, for the week before this event, we were sending out tweets every day reminding people specifically of the, um, you know, the live cast that we were going to be doing. Yeah, I, I will absolutely concur with that. It was good practice. So it, it gets pretty intense. Like I say, start a couple weeks out with some of the things we're looking at here, and then just, you know, keep building intensity in that, in that week before. Yeah, and I would say just to elaborate on the one week thing, that was more of a, of, of a B2C model. So, you know, in, in, in Jeff's world and whatever various industries you're in, those, I mean, those time frames might change. I think, you know, specifically in food safety, you're at the, it just seems to me you're dealing with people who are a little more meticulous about their <laughs> schedules. And so, you know, two or three weeks, they'll get that, they'll look at it, they'll put it on their calendar. So, you know, that probably, you know, would, would work well. So, I mean, I wouldn't take the, the one week thing as an absolute gospel, but. Well, it makes sense. I mean, for me, if you try to go something a week out, you're probably looking at a full calendar, so it makes sense. Yeah. But certainly, I would not try to do three plus weeks out. Okay. Yeah. You no, know, except just for, say, a listing. Yeah. Or right. a tiny website. But as far as the real <coughs> promotional yeah. meat goes. And, as I mentioned, one of the great joys of the uh, use of LinkedIn groups is they send out the periodic alerts. And as long as there's an active discussion going there for that topic, those alerts keep coming out. And, you know, you're looking at people who are highly self-qualified because they have joined these groups. And you can often get significant numbers. Like, uh, for example, the GFSI for Food Container Manufacturers webinar. These are the groups that I uh, posted those announcements in. And as you see, we go from fairly small, this little one that I have for the Quality Insurance Division Exec Committee, all the way up to the Packaging Professionals one that is just nipping at 15,000 attendees. That is a lot of eyes to get in front of. And when you add that all up, you know, you're pushing, like I say, a 20,000 uh, mail list. You know, you're looking at how do yeah, you get a big I mail list. This is a fantastic tool. Yeah. And they're doing all the hard work for you. I love that. <laughs> Shameless plugs. <laughs> the, ISA, the ISA group on LinkedIn is like over 8,000 people. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I have a question. What are your thoughts, our preferences on like the live webinars versus like an on doing a recorded one? Like what do you think is more effective? Uh, I, guess both, it I guess it depends on what. Yeah, they, they both have their role. Yeah. I, I, uh, I can't imagine doing one without the other, shall I say. Okay. Uh, and there's a, there's a reuse factor too. Yeah. You know, a live webinar becomes a recorded one. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean remember, call a second law. Right, once published many. There you go, yeah. That's that's a component of it. And um, and we will look at a few examples of that as well. Chris, I yeah. know our, our power group had one that they did just a few weeks ago that I guess the original sign up was somewhere around seven. <coughs> mm -hmm. The online attendance actually kind of fell outside of the group because it was only about two hundred. But in the last three weeks, there's been over a thousand views of the recording. That's outstanding. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you have to record them. You have to keep them out. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, when you were talking about the 50%, I was one. I, I was putting myself in, in in the shoes of signing up for recordings, and I've actually changed my behavior now. Where um, if I'm signing up for a lot of webinars. Mm -hmm that I have no intention of attending live because I know they're gonna be recorded. Right. And so, you know, I'll go and I'll, I'll view them later. So I'm wondering, I was wondering 
how that 50%, so it sounds like you're seeing a similar behavior. Yeah, this is this is just, I mean, it's one instance, but yeah. it's funny how this one, you know, like I say, the, the online views in the three weeks following are greater than what was signed up to start with. That, that certainly can happen. And like John, I, I would say probably 60, 70% of the things I sign up for, I absolutely do not plan on being there that day. And just because queue them up and go look at them. You, you, can. you get the follow-up notice. Mm -hmm. Here's the posting, here's where it's recorded, right. and you can go look at it later. Now, a case of that, uh, one of the ones we did in this series was uh, on uh, using SPC methods to really work the OEE API. And it was funny because the actual uh, original sign up was very small for it. Now, it was late June, so that didn't uh, help. But we've gotten Within about three weeks after we put that up, we had three times as, again, like your number, people view it as had actually attended the report. So that it's, that's very nice that it's got uh, the probability of long-term life. And as we're going to look at its subsequent rework, it's like uh, we're going to go into a magazine article based on that, a publisher, so on, et cetera. Yeah? So like product training, do, do you think because we're, I think when we're starting doing product training, that's going to be a recorded type mm -hmm. thing. P personally, I think if, if I don't sign up for something at 10 when it's, 10 when it's happening, I'll never go back and watch it. So I'm kind of like the opposite. For like a product training, for like an intense type training, do you think on me? I mean, or do you? Both. I mean, remember, that's part of the characteristics of looking at this customer 2.0. You're having to cater to a wide variety of personalities, uh, job characteristics, uh, time use characteristics, etc. And one of the virtues of this kind of uh, web-based media is that you can set up to accommodate all those variations with very little overhead. And, and, and that, that's a really charming aspect of this. Because there are some people, man, if it's not on their calendar and they're going to do it, they'll never do it. Other people, yeah. Well, what else am I going to do at lunch hour? Or, you know, whatever. That's why those follow-up emails are important. Yeah, you know, say. after you do the live one to say, you know, right. here's the news And don't forget about the, you know, that's um, going to change. Make, yeah, making sure that wherever you're, you're, whatever technology you're using, wherever you're stashing that, for people to go back and look at it later, make sure it's supported on iPads. Uh, you know. Podcasts, if that's you know, if that's appropriate, make it easy for people to consume where and when and how they want to consume. Yeah. Okay. Other aspects, you know, again, we're looking at establishing that credibility. You want to be one of those vendors in the short list, so you get your chance at that at the committee. Uh, another aspect of using social media. Look at the other blogs that are out there, like again, food prep. This is called Meeting Place. It's a big one for meat processing. Uh, Jim Marsden writes a topic called uh, Safety Zone, which focuses on the issues that we're discussing here. You had an article, very nice and timely. What is the Global Food Safety Initiative? So, sure enough, John Sarak and I hop on. Here are two postings, uh, uh, one from John and one from myself. Of course, uh, in here was the link to where you could sign up for this webinar we were having on the topic. It worked wonderfully well. <laughs> so keep alert of that. I mean, Google Alerts and every other, any similar type of tool. Who in the blog sphere is talking about the topics that you're going to be talking about? And if they are, hop on over there and religiously use the comment section or the backlink. It's it's wonderful promotion. Stuff. And again, like building that list as you were asking, there's an awful lot of basically uh, updated guerrilla tactics here. And but it's so effective, and the quality you can get out of it is so much higher than going to the list brokers. I get 10 to 15 percent of my web traffic from comments I leave on blogs. I can believe that. It's, it's very effective. 
mean, it's surprising how much people actually read this things and comment on it. So, again, I'm going to confess my orientation to having some monitoring and analytics and measuring process. It's my business. So, here are the entry points and the extra detail report out of the web monitoring software we had at that time. And, you know, use my own tools, right? Uh, so, any type of time series stuff like that, I just, you know, throw up a control chart. And I can see what are the unusual circumstances you know, with the descriptive information I report. You can drill down. It's like, you know, did a bailing cause that excursion? Did uh, some other event cause that? If it did, keep track on it and repeat it. Uh, what is the stable performance I can expect out of just the routine stuff with the LinkedIn and with everything else going on? Again, it gives me a much better idea as I keep developing this program, what I can expect, uh, you know, what kind of lead times to get results I can expect, and so forth. The better we know and characterize our process, the better we're going to get at it and the better results. Yeah? Have you gotten to the point in your process yet where you're doing any A-B testing with either your um, the emails that you're sending out or um, your landing pages? done a little bit of that. I haven't spent as much time on that as I should, but I have done some of that. Uh, especially you know, in a few cases, the specific stuff like yep. uh, trying to develop the feeling, you know, improve the performance of what I'm doing. So then we come to the execution, you know, just the basics. Are you going to manage with the expert speaker? You know, whatever kind of facilities you're using. Uh, you know, physically how you're going to do the broadcast, what kind of uh, uh, webinar software you're using. You know, all that stuff you must be aware of. Having your checklist, the staff, and of course all this is the goal, both the successful presentation and as we discussed here, the successful recording. Uh, you do want structured contact with both the registrants, the attendees, and the total email list uh, for follow-up. Do some telemarketing, follow-up surveys, you know, things like SurveyMonkey are wonderful. Uh, and, uh, and if appropriate, make offers. Uh, anything that attracts attention. So this is a uh, typical mail going out, email. Uh, in this particular case, that we uh, will often use both these the embedded stuff within go to webinar, or also our direct, you know, especially during the whole you know, total mailing list. But whatever it is, do it religiously. Yeah. Do you find direct mail still to be effective? Like, what would your thoughts on that? Um, we do some. But uh, for webinars, I, I do almost not. Yeah. Now, if there is some piece going out that the lead time on the mailing is appropriate for promoting a webinar, I may put an insert. Yeah. But it's not nothing I depend upon. And uh, going back to our LinkedIn pages, remember I was saying that if the discussion is active, Every time there's a new entry, that triggers a new alert email. Here, two of the entries I put in. Uh, here's the recording availability. And here also is a little video preview that I put in before. So each one of those events triggers a new alert email to all the members of that group. And uh, then we're going to repurpose this so, you know, John has mentioned, and I mentioned here, that yes, you've done all the work. Let's get the maximum yield out of it. So we have screencasts, you know, your recorded webinars, or subsets of the webinar. Uh, web content, again, we've developed all this material, like, you know, web pages, et cetera, collateral. Uh, and it's a rich source of continuous stream of social media content on your blogs, your tweets, 
special interest group postings. Uh, remember, write once, publish many. And then uh, media follow up. So, for example, here's uh, a posting press release in the International Food Safety and Quality Network, you know, the news clearing house for again, a particular vertical market. And I'm focusing upon this uh, safety issue, safety systems issue for my example, but whatever is equivalent in your industry. Uh, and here is an announcement of putting out a packaging on a web page, basically, of the first series of four for the food. A new event. We're putting out all four of them in one group. Same, same, but, you know, they want content too. <coughs> Uh, making little screencast uh, promos or trailers. Not quite the old Don Botain, you know, in a world where microbes swarm. You know, can't quite do his style, but, and this is a little more subtle. In fact, some might say they're boring, but uh, they work. You know, again, it's another source. YouTube is highly ranked in the search engines. In fact, one of the glorious aspects of this is that if you put in, you know, I did several permutations here in the search thing on video, coming right on up the top here. And actually, compared to these three people, spent a lot more money on this than I do. <laughs> but the timeliness of it, choosing the right topics, everything else. This is the period in which the Global Food Safety Initiative, Food Safety Management Systems, other such appropriate tags and keywords are very important. Very, very good periods. And um, <clears throat> put out the release on that YouTube posting. Here's a Google alert on a pickup for a publication, this particular case in UK, one called Processing Talk. Man, here's the posting in their online newsletter. Video summarizes, you can see the localize it with the S, Food Safety Compliance Webinars. So not only have we done the original work, each one of those had their publicity. Now the fact that we're posting them as a group gets their publicity. Yeah, right once publishment, friends. And of course, let's not forget the fundamentals here in your blog. So every one of these events is a blog entry on the website with all the appropriate links. <coughs> but wait, there's more. One thing that never fails, I love. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Lisa Pierce, who's one of the editors of Packaging Digest, uh, attended uh, the webinar Track Trace, happy to look for some material. So Dave Miller, who was the primary presenter myself, put together an article for her. Uh, she takes the byline and take, took the byline in online form and the print version, we had the byline, I don't care, because the links all come back to the same place. But that was very wonderful. That was actually published uh, two and a half months after the webinar. It was a very short term in time. So what kind of results do we have out of this sequence? Again, very specialized topic, specialized market. We had 502 unique attendees to this sequence. 131 of those attended two or more sessions. Reach and frequency. Getting that frequency is good. Wonderful source of content creation. We had a derivative media coverage. Actually, from that series, there are, besides the one I put up there for uh, Packaging Digest, there are two other articles confirmed that are in process. And we'll probably end up getting more. Uh, the acute value is very, very you bring in pretty high level people, uh, you would promote that association. Uh, again, we're trying to get 
to be desirable people to be on that short list. Very effective for them. And of course, there's sales activity. Uh, people are attending, we do the telemarketing and email follow-up, find out what their interests are, and there actually are projects that came directly out of this. So, any questions or discussions we can do in our few minutes left here? Okay. Well, if you uh, have anything you want, always feel free to email me or call me. And uh, I love discussing the execution of these kind of tactics. It's fun stuff. They're very effective. Not to mention it works well. Thank you. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you.